little story, get you warmed up. It's the only funny thing that's going to happen today because the sermon is really kind of a downer. Uh, so, <clears throat> we have a piano teacher come upstairs on Tuesdays, and he gives lessons to Addie and Bruce. And I was telling my parents this story last night. And Addie, after the lesson, was so filled with gratitude to Mr. Meek. Um, thank you so much. She wanted to give him out of her little baggy jar money. And thank you so much for coming and, and teaching us. And I love it. And she gives him a tip. And, oops, excuse me. He's walking down the stairs. And he's like, oh, thank you. And I turned to Addie and I said, oh, Addie, that was so nice. How much did you give him? A dime. <laughs> so our piano teacher got a dime from Addie. Anyway, that's just a warm up. <clears throat> hey, now for serious sake, um, we're going to be in uh, First Chronicles chapter 10. And uh, I'll let you guys get your coffee and then move back to your seats. You'll want to be seated for this one. It's kind of a wild ride. So find First Chronicles. Where is that? Uh, Joshua and Judges and the story of Ruth, right? I don't know. First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First Chronicles, chapter ten. So um, we'll flip there and then I'll say a word of prayer over the sermon. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Indeed, it is precious. And uh, as mom prayed, it's going out from many, many mouths uh, this morning. And that's to honor you. And it's to remind your people of your ways. We praise you, O oh God, that we have the printed word. That not only do we get to hear the word on Sunday, but we get to keep it day in and day out. And when we are confused and lost, um, or when we're needing encouragement, we get to crack the Bible open, and we get to look and see your face, and see your way, and know your way. Imprint it on our hearts, we pray, Jesus. Amen. Mm. The point of... Today's sermon, if you get nothing else, you can write this down, is that there is no replacement for your own personal faithfulness to God. I'll say it again, there is no replacement. You cannot replace your personal faithfulness to God with somebody else's or an excuse from your past or an excuse for what's about to happen in the future. There's no replacement for how you will be faithful to God your whole life. So... With that, let's jump into the text. First Chronicles chapter 10. I'm going to read the entire chapter. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. And the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul. The archers found him, and he was wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword, thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died. Thus Saul died, and he and his three sons, and all his house died together. And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that the army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled, and the Philistines came and lived in them. Verse 8. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They stripped him, took his head and his armor, and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. But when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took away the body of Saul, the bodies of his sons, and brought them to Jabesh. 
They buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days. So, Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. I want to uh, unpack the suicide of Saul, just starting in verse 1 a little bit, just so that we have a frame of reference for what, what on earth is going on and why I chose the text. It's a difficult text when you think about suicide, when you think about a king falling on his sword and committing suicide. Verse 1, the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. So I want to unpack those three things. The Philistines, who were they? The Israelites and, and Mount Gilboa. Just so you have a frame of reference because it's difficult. No, that's not what I want here. Sorry about that. Um, we'll see if it does that again. It's difficult for us in our day and age where we live in such a great time of peace to connect with a violent text and a text where um, you have these warring tribes. So I want to unpack it a little bit. So the Philistines. The Philistines were a tribe of the Canaanites that were left in the land of Israel. And um, they, their job essentially was to make constant warfare with the Israelites. They were the thorn in their side. If you remember, Goliath was one of the Philistines, and they were taunting Israel from the other hill. Remember, and David came down and chopped off his head after he struck him with a stone. The Philistines had incredible, um, incredibly aggressive practices of how they killed, especially royalty. For example, they followed um, some of what the Assyrians did. Uh, if they found royalty, they would stake them to the ground with a spear through their hands and their feet, and they would flay their flesh. And then they would take in procession their head. They would chop off their head. And this is kind of what we see a little bit, that they would take it through their cities, and it was just a total mockery. There was this parade, and it was just a total mockery of the reigning ruler of their enemy. The Philistines were greatly to be feared because they had no mercy. There was no mercy. And Saul knew that, and so Saul, in his constant warfare, was also fairly merciless with the Philistines. If you turn over to Judges chapter 3, there's an explanation for this... Uh, and I'll just read it for you. There's an explanation for the Philistines that I find uh, incredibly helpful in understanding why they were left there in the promised land. Um, in, in chapter 3 of Judges, it says, These are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. So there we have our first clue. This nation, the Philistines, were there to test Israel. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians, the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon, and from Mount Belhermon as far as Labo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel, to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. We'll get back to that point, but the, the Philistines were left in Israel to test them. Constant badgering, constant warfare, and it was a test. The Lord is saying, I'm testing you to see if you're really going to follow my commandments. So, even in uh, 1 Samuel 14.52, the narrator says that there was hard fighting against the Philistines all the days of Saul. It was Saul's overarching problem. He had to deal with the Philistines. 
all the time. So when we get back to our text, we have the Philistines fought against Israel. I want to give you just a brief, brief history of where we were at in Israel. All the way from the exodus of Egypt, they come out as a new nation. They're wandering around in the desert. They finally get conquest of the land of Canaan through Joshua. And there's just this total rampage, yet they don't totally succeed in getting out all of the nations into the uh, promised land. And so we have the, uh, the Israelites in the land now, the promised land where they're supposed to inhabit forever, but they've got a problem, and that's these remaining tribes. And it was because of their unfaithfulness. It was because of their unfaithfulness to God. The Bible depicts Israel's unfaithfulness in very strong lang language again in Judges. And they, um, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. This is from Judges chapter 2. And they served the Baals. They abandoned the Lord their God, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. So the Lord raises up judges, this is verse 16, who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked to obey the commands of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up the judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who had afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So you have in your mind now, you've got a picture of the Philistines who are there to test Israel, and they're fighting against them constantly, making warfare with them, and this is Saul's task at hand. And then you have Israel who comes out out of Egypt into the promised land finally and they don't attain it and they follow after other gods God raises up judges and they fall away and God raises up judges and they fall away and the last of the judges is Samuel God raises up Samuel and he delivers the people because he has pity on them and the people say to Samuel a crazy thing when Samuel's about to die we want a king over us, that we may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go before us and fight our battles. So now Samuel appoints Saul. Here comes Saul. So Israel again rejects God as their true king, and they tell Samuel, you're about to die, your sons don't follow after you, we need a king like everybody else. So here comes King Saul. Now, the third thing that we want to unpack in verse 1. We talked about the Philistines. We've talked about Israel. The Philistines fought against Israel, right? That was for their testing. It was just par for the course. And the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. So I want to talk a little bit about Mount Gilboa because this actually, this area, there's like two mountain ranges that kind of come, they end, and there's this valley. This is in the territory of Issachar. Here's the Sea of, uh, the sea of Galilee, and then you've got the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. And there's this little valley in, in the territory of Issachar, uh, Issachar. and it's, it's got a plain and then a couple mountains, a couple mounts, I should say, hills, um, are on either side. Mount Gilboa is on one of those sides. And so this valley hosted incredible battles, incredible battles. Um, for example, uh, Barak, he was, uh, he was a prophet with Deborah, the prophetess. They were part of the judges. They defeated 900 chariots plus all of the men um, of the Canaanites in this battle. So great victory for the Lord. On this, on this uh, um, plain, there was also the great story of Gideon. You know, his 300, and they defeat the whole host of the Midianites. Great victories for the Lord. And here we have a tragic turn in the history. Saul's men are 
brutally murdered. And Saul, instead of having the favor of the Lord, just like Gideon, his predecessor, just like the stories of Barak and, and Deborah, instead of having that victory, he kills himself in this place, Mount Gilboa. And the last thing is uh, there's a city, an apocalyptic battle of Armageddon. That will be on this plain here. So it's kind of a unique situation for where Saul's life ends. So we unpack the verse, and um, I, I just, I was wondering, how does somebody, how does the first king of Israel go from being such a great king to killing himself? Taking his sword, I have no other recourse but to fall on my own sword and die. And I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> how Saul got there and kind of go through three stories. Because I think in our life as Christians, sometimes we can look around and we could say, wait, I knew that person. You know, I went to church with that person. How is it that they ended up here? How is, it, how is this possible? And this is where our, the point of the sermon comes in, that you cannot replace your own personal faithfulness to God. I want to take a look at three things from Paul's pa uh, Saul's past, just kind of flashback in his life. How does he end up in this battle killing himself? You'll see if you uh, turn to Samuel chapter 13. You'll see that time and time again, Saul always had an excuse for not fully obeying God. Time and time again. The first story is um, Saul's unlawful sacrifice. That comes from Samuel chapter 13. Now, there was a battle. The Philistines arrayed their army. It was customary for the king to hear from the word of the Lord his battle strategy. And there's a great fear and trembling among, amongst him and his troops that the Philistine horde is as numerous as the sands on the sea. And they're at this place called Mitchmash. And Saul, in his fear, wants to hear from the word of the Lord. And that was Samuel's job. And Samuel says, hey, wait for me seven days. So, we're going to pick up in verse 8, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. You can feel the fear. Seven days has come and gone, Saul. Samuel isn't around. And the people start scattering. I'm out of here. This host of Philistines are going to brutally murder us. Saul had to wait. Wait just a little bit longer. The narrator does such a great job. You can feel the sense of urgency there. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. You can see in your mind the red flag going up. Saul, don't do it. No, Saul. No. He offered the burnt offering. And as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Darn. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Ah, now all the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. You can hear his excuses. They're just loathsome. And I point my judgmental finger down at Saul, and I go, Saul, you, nincompoop. I can hear your excuses just oozing out of your mouth. And Samuel can too. Verse 13. Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. You can hear, Samuel, you have done foolishly. And 
there is, on Saul's part, an excuse. And Samuel knows that there is no excuse for you wholeheartedly following the Lord. The second... So you see here, Saul is trying to blame it on Samuel. Well, you delayed and, you know, I forced myself. The second example comes from just a couple pages later. Saul has a very difficult task to do, and that is to destroy the Amalekites totally and completely. And without getting too far away from the text, you should know that when Israel was coming up out of Egypt, the Bible doesn't say, but they... They mistreated the Israelites. We don't know. But so grievous was the Amalekites' treatment of the Israelites on their way out of Egypt that God wanted them utterly destroyed. Not only the people, but God says, we're in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, in verse 2, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now, Go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them. Kill both man, woman, child, and infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. This is an incredible order from the Lord. It was incredible on a couple of counts because in our day and age, in our peaceful day and age, we how horrific to kill everything. How horrific to kill not just man, woman, but child and infants and the sheep and donkeys and the oxen. What do they have to do with it? So grievous was their sin that God said, I want them wiped totally out, completely gone. And it was difficult for a soldier because your income was part of the loot that you received. You notice the Philistines go strip the slain after a war. So part of their, part of the difficulty for a king was to control his soldiers. Hey, you may not touch anything. You may, you may have nothing for your family. The spoils of war is everything. So Saul has to not only control himself, but he has to control his men. Now, if we jump down to verse 13, uh, we know that Saul doesn't do it. And it says that Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you, uh, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. No, he didn't. He's a liar, because he kept the king alive. He kept Agag, uh, the king alive, and he kept some of the nice sheep and donkeys and oxen alive. So Saul's lying right through his teeth, and Samuel knows it. And Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. The, the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. Oh, Saul, your excuses are loathsome. You did not devote everything to destruction. And you're blaming the people? You're the king. You're the king of Israel, and you're blaming the people did it? No. So you might be wondering, okay, I can see the writing on the wall for Saul. The pieces are starting to make sense as to why he would fall on his own sword and die. But he, he had kind of done right, right? I mean, he was sacrificing to the Lord. No. I'm not sure if you remember the story of Joshua and Jericho. Joshua was told, everything in Jericho goes. Nothing. And so zealous was Joshua that everything get dis got destroyed that like a little cloak was taken and a bar of gold or something like that. Achan took a couple things. One guy out of the whole host of Israel took one thing or two things or three things and he hid them under his tent. <laughs> And they, the whole army of Israel then was defeated at Ai. And, and, and Joshua goes to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord tells him, you did not wholly, command, wholly obey my commandments. And so they, he kind of casts lots and, and finally gets forward to Achan. And you know what they did? 
They took Achan, his family, his kids, his oxen, everything that he owned, and they all stoned him to death. They threw rocks, the whole nation of Israel, throwing rocks. So grievous was the sin that when God said, I want everything devoted to destruction, and there's a little thing that one guy took, or a couple little things that God took, that was deserving of death. Saul knew the story of Jericho. He knew how bad it would be for him if he did not fully obey the command of the Lord. And we see the writing on the wall for Saul's life. And everything inside my heart goes, Saul, stop it, just like Samuel. Samuel says, stop. Verse 16. Then Samuel said to Saul, after he gives us all these excuses, stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And so Samuel goes on to tell him. The third thing that I want to bring up is Saul, on the night before he died, goes to <clears throat> seek out God's, uh, God's word for him. Again, we have the battle lines drawing up. Now we're back at Mount Gilboa in the valley of Esdralon where uh, these great battles have taken place. And Saul is going to inquire of the Lord, Lord, what do I do? What's my battle strategy here? And God is silent. So Saul goes and does something that you should never do. And that is he seeks a medium. He seeks somebody who calls up dead spirits. Um, by the way, yeah, we should never do that. Christians don't do that. I just thought I should say that. So that's Samuel 28. If you would turn there, it's a very uh, unnerving story. This is the night before Saul dies. Verse 6. When, Samuel, uh, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or urim or by prophets. So the Lord is silent on his behalf. The Lord has rejected Saul as king. We jump down to uh, verse 8. And Saul does something that is so stupid, we're all screaming it in our heads, and the narrator does a good job of letting us say, stop, don't do it. Saul disguised himself and put on other garments. This is verse 8. And went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. This is a, a, a witch, a medium, a lady that calls up wicked spirits. Uh, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, Divine for me by a spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name. Verse 11. The woman said, Who shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. Now Samuel's dead spirit comes up. I'm not going to try and explain this, but Samuel's dead spirit comes up and there's this interaction. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice and the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You're Saul. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? So apparently this lady is seeing it. Saul's not seeing it. The woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. He said to her, What, what, what is his appearance? She said, an old man is coming up, and he's wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. That's going to get you out of the pickle, Saul. Yeah, let's do that. <clears throat> Verse 15. Samuel said to Saul, so now Samuel, somehow his dead, his spirit, not his body, is talking to Saul. There's this interaction. And Samuel said to Saul, verse 15, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I've summoned you to tell me what I shall do. You hear his excuses? At first it was, well, Samuel, you delayed in coming. That's why I offered the sacrifice. And then it was, well, the people took of the spoil, and they didn't utterly destroy. And now it's, well, God is silent. You hear his excuses for fully obeying the Lord, and you're just like, stop. How far can you go? Verse 16. 
Samuel said, why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow, you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. So the judgment is pronounced. Saul, you will die in battle tomorrow. Saul, now we jump forward to the scene where Saul is going to kill himself. Saul is going to fall on his sword. And yet, so we have these three stories, and yet I think the story in and of itself is another example of how Saul did not obey. Saul heard from Samuel, you're going to die tomorrow. So perhaps it was the great fear that seized him. Perhaps it was the fear of how the Philistines would mistreat him. Perhaps it was the fear of losing the kingdom, having his sons die, having all of, all of his army die. Perhaps it was that. But regardless, Saul had the option of saying, Lord, this is your will for me and letting the archer's wounds kill him, so to speak. Suicide was not the logical conclusion of a valiant king here. You're not going, oh yes, this was the right thing to do. I'm looking at the mistreatment that's going to happen to you. I'm looking at the horrific scenario that you're in. Yes, suicide is the right answer. No, it wasn't the logical conclusion. It was another step in Saul's excusing his own disobedience. It was one more little thing that Saul just wouldn't give to the Lord. Even in my death, the Lord will not have um, preeminence. And it's a scary thing. It was another missed opportunity for Saul to yield to God's will. If you think about the story of Esther facing almost certain death, before she faces the king, she tells Mordecai, you know, not being invited to face the king, she would die. She tells Mordecai, if I perish, I perish. Saul could have had that attitude. Saul could have had that attitude. If I die, it is the Lord's will. I will die serving the Lord. But he didn't. He fell on his sword and died. So I want to talk about uh, suicide for just a little bit. Because it's... Um, kind of a shameful thing, really. And it's, it's kind of a despicable act. The, the narrator in Chronicles allows us to feel that this is despicable. This is not valiant. But suicide is like our own personal sin, if you think about it for just a second. Its final effect is to kill us. That is what sin literally does. So if you think of, oh, I've heard a story of a suicide and it just kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies because it's, it's so unfair and it's so, it's such a um, selfish thing. That is exactly what sin is. Un um, undealt with sin is like suicide. And its final effect on a person is to destroy them eternally. So I want to read why Saul died again in First Chronicles. Because the narrator makes it very clear in verse 13. Saul died for his breach of faith. You cannot pull the wool over God's eyes with your sin. God calls it like it is. Saul died for his breach of faith. We went over those three examples. His unlawful sacrifice. He didn't devote everything to destruction. He sought a medium. 
He died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He didn't seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. God sees through our excuses. I want to get to our application here, and I have three points for our application. Because there is no replacement for your full obedience to God's commands. You cannot slough it off on, oh, the people did this. Oh, Samuel, you were delayed in coming. Oh, the Lord didn't answer me, so I'm excusing my disobedience. You may not do that. God sees through it, and He calls it a breach of faith. Number one, application. Excuses for full obedience to God's commands are loathsome. They stink. Like a drunkard's apologies for his rage. Oh, I'm so sorry. Or his spending. Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry. After a while, you're like, just stop it. You stink. Your excuses stink or they're, or they're folly. They, do some, they always do something ridiculous when they're drunk. Excuses are like a drunkard's excuses. When you don't fully obey the Lord, they, they just, they're loathsome. God sees right through them, and He calls them a breach of faith. Two. Some sins in our lives are like the Philistines to the Israelites. Some sins in our life are for our testing, like the Philistines were for the Israelites' testing to know whether you will really follow the Lord. And some sins you have to battle your whole life. I'm not saying there isn't freedom. God delivers us. But some sins you just got to battle, like those darn Philistines, the thorns in our side. Each battle is a new chance to yield to the potter's moment. Or, each battle is another day of hardening without the gentle touch of the Master. And you look at those battles and you see the hardening in Saul. Each battle a hardening for Saul without the touch of the potter's hands. I want to give you some examples from my personal life because this is where it really hit home. Some sins that I struggle with, like I struggle greatly with the sin of just quitting. You know, I have this landscape business, mow lawns, and I always keep in my back pocket like the thought that if it doesn't work out, I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to slap down the trump card. I quit. And I pretend like it would be God's will. Like, God clearly had me start this business. But I've kept that in my back pocket for a really long time. Just quit it. And it's a shameful thing. And it's a sin that I have to battle. Stop it. I'm just now at the point in my business where I have been here longer than I've worked really anywhere. Just close to three years. And so the, the feeling has resurged. Isn't that silly? Three years, really? That's it? Yes. But I battle with that. Just the idea of quitting. And uh, now that the money is coming in, I battle with spending. Ooh, what can I spend money on? Yeah. Finally, money's coming in. And it's like the Philistines just... I can either use it as an opportunity to yield to God's hand in my life, to yield to His will and say, Lord, thank you. No, thank you. Or, I can succumb to the battle and my heart becomes hard. I want you to just take a second to think, what are some of those things that maybe you've, you've prayed for deliverance from, you just haven't had it? Um, or it, it's just... It's just kind of the thorn in your side that you just have to battle. God wants to use those to test you, to see if you will really keep the command of the Lord. Perhaps it's a quick temper. You just, you just let yourself. Quick temper. 
Somebody cuts you off. Hey, Perhaps, you know, the, the rage you just justifiably feel when you're listening to the news or whatever, and you just let it ooze over you, and you get frustrated. Perhaps your sin is like pessimism, constantly thinking negatively. I don't know. We all have our own cross to bear. I know you can think of yours. My third application point is sin's final act is to kill us. Just like... <laughs> James. <laughs> yes. It is scary, isn't it? That is what sin does. Just like Saul killing himself. I want to read James chapter hey, 1. Speaking of, yeah. Verse 14. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Here it comes. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Please make no mistake about your sin. It will kill you. And either you will be the master or it will master you. That goes way back to Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 3, when God is talking to Cain. Watch out. Sin's desire is to rule over you, but you must master it. Sin has the desire to kill you. And that is what will happen. But, thanks be to God, He gives us every opportunity for us to yield to Him. As He did Saul in his death to yield to the archer's wounds, that we may have eternal life. It is not too late. It is not too late. For it is said today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of testing in the wilderness. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I want to have um, just an opportunity before I get into my last point. I want to have an opportunity to lay down with somebody who loves you, cares about you, lay down your burdens. I want the, the deacons uh, to stand in the back, if I may, i have the deacons stand in the back. This is a precious time. The narrative in Chronicles is for us to point our finger at Saul. Saul. Why? We could see the writing on the wall. We could see the train wreck happening. And it's really for us. It's really for us. I want to give you the opportunity to make to make it right between you and the Lord, this sin has really distracted me from following the Lord wholeheartedly. And if it's not you, as my mom had said, perhaps it's somebody you know. Perhaps you see a Saul and you're going, I see this, I see the outcome, I love you, I care about you, don't do this! And you can pray for that person as well. I want to spend just a few minutes and uh, if I could, yeah, Shane, you want to stand on this corner? You may go to a deacon in prayer, and then I will conclude with our uh, last point and the benediction. Let's pray. Verse 15. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. For I said... Only let them not rejoice over me who boasts against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall. My pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I'm sorry for my sin. My foes are vigorous. They are mighty. Many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. 
Oh my God, be not far from me. Do not forsake me, O oh Lord. Oh my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord, my salvation. Make haste to help me, Lord, my salvation. You may spend more time with the deacons if you would like. Here's my last point. The adopted church is full of stout-hearted Christians. I just want you to know that when I'm praying for you guys. I think we are stout-hearted. We are strong Christians in this church. I want you to look at the life and the grievous sin of Saul. And let me tell you a little story about a guy named Polycarp who sat under St. John. He was his student who was martyred at 86 years old. He devoted himself to prayer and teaching the word of God. Polycarp when the Romans came to kill him, he, he had a vision that his pillow was on fire and he knew that he was going to be burned at the stake. Now, you have the old man Saul who's close to his 70s killing himself. And you have Polycarp, 86 years old. And when he is going to be burned at the stake, he says, 86 years have I served him. He has done me no wrong. Why now shall I forsake my God and my Savior? That is who we are. When I think of the adopted church, I think we are stout-hearted. We would do that. We would do that. And we would say, I've served him all these years. Why now would I forsake him? Why would I forsake my God and my Savior? Please stand with me as I give you the benediction. It comes from James. Chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man and woman. Blessed is the man and woman who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love Him. Amen? Amen. Please join us for lunch.